Ciao, Bella. Welcome to another episode of Reading with Bella. I'm Christina, and if you're new here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. No matter how long you've been here, I always appreciate your time. We are again in the car, but this time I brought my Jabberwocky with me because I wanted to get in maybe at least one reading um, video and uh, then go um, maybe make a couple more. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Whenever I have unquiet time these days. Um, but uh, we are now at the point where we have reached Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which was written in 1865 and, well, mostly finished. Let's just put it that way, in 1865. Now, this is not the, the novel, okay? These are poems from the novel. Uh, so, the story, right, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which has been usually shortened to Alice in Wonderland, uh, was written for uh, the daughter of someone who is important in Lewis Carroll's life. And, uh, I mean, you can research all of that, but, uh, it was not strictly in prose format. So it wasn't just lots of sentences, right? It was written with a young child in mind. So if they're reading something, their brain is going to stop paying attention after a certain amount of time. Let's see if this makes a difference because that's really, okay, that helps my eyeballs at least. I don't know if that helps yours. Um, but they need different things for their attention span, right? So they will need something that is going to go a little fast, a little slow, a little silly, a little serious, right? It can't just be steady all the time. They'll stop listening and some adults will too. So there you have it. But these are just the poems. So it's not the whole novel that I'm reading to you. And the first one is what you might call the prologue or the introduction. It's the very beginning of the novel, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, and it's called All in the Golden Afternoon. All right, let's get started. All in the Golden Afternoon. All in the Golden Afternoon, full leisurely we glide, for both our oars with little skill by little arms are plied, while little hands make vain pretense our wanderings to guide. Ah, oh, cruel three, in such an hour, beneath such dreamy weather, to beg a tale of breath too weak to stir the tiniest feather. Yet what can one poor voice avail against three tongues together? Imperious Prima flashes forth her edict to begin it. In gentle tones, Secunda hopes there will be nonsense in it. While Tertia interrupts the tale, not one, not more than once a minute. Anon to sudden silence one, in fancy they pursue, the dream child moving through a land of wonders wild and new, in friendly chat with bird and beast, and half believe it true. So that is the introduction, right? And ever as the story drained, the wells of fancy dry, and faintly strove that weary one to put the subject by. The rest next time. It is next time, the voice's happy cry. Thus grew the tale of Wonderland, thus slowly, one by one. Its quaint events were hammered out, and now the tale is done. And home we steer a merry crew beneath the setting sun. Alice! A childish story take, and with a gentle hand, lay it where childhood's dreams are twined in memory's mystic band. Like pilgrims withered wreaths of flowers plucked in a far-off land. So that was the rest of that poem. And you can see how uh, multiple children were asking, right? Because when you research the story, if you do research the story, uh, it was originally told orally. So it was told during a series of... Um, visits and then Lewis Carroll put pen to paper for uh, Alice to keep 
the stories. So the next one is called How Doth the Little Crocodile. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spreads his claws, and welcomes little fish in with gently smiling jaws. All right, this next one is called Mouse Tales, and I think it's uh, very much shows Lewis Carroll's style here, right, in that it is in the shape of a tail. We lived beneath the mat. We lived beneath the mat, warm and snug and fat, but one woe and that was the cat. To our joys a clog and our eyes a fog, on our hearts a log was the dog. When the cat's away, the mice will pe play, but alas, one day, so they say, came the dog and cat, hunting for a rat, crushed the mice all flat, each one as he sat underneath the mat, warm and snug and fat. Think of that. And this is the next part of Mouse Tales. Furry said to. Furry said to a mouse that he met in the house, Let us both go to law. I will pros, pros, I will prosecute you. Let's start that over. <laughs> Furry said to. Furry said to a mouse that he met in the house, Let us both go to law. I will prosecute you. Come I'll take no denial, we must have the trial, for really this morning I have nothing to do. Said the mouse to the cur, such a trial, dear sir, with no judge or jury, would be wasting our breath. I'll be judge, I'll be jury, said the cunning old furry. I'll try the whole cause and condemn you to death. <laughs> it's a very different game of cat and mouse, don't you think? <laughs> right, so this one is in a little different place in the story and it is called you are old father william the young man said you are old father william the young man said and your hair has become very white and yet you incessantly stand on your head do you think at your age it is right in my youth fa father william replied to his son i feared it might injure the brain but now that i'm perfectly sure i have none why i do it again and again <laughs> You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly uncom fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason for that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his gray locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment, one shilling a box, allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finish the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife. And the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. <laughs> you are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Yet you balance an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? <laughs> I have answered three questions and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off or I'll kick you downstairs. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, okay. And the next one is the Duchess's Lullaby. Speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. In which the cook and the baby joined. Wow, wow, wow. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes. For he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when it pleases. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, he got into the pepper all right. <laughs> the next one is called Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat. 
twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. Up above the world you fly like a tea tray in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat. <laughs> the next one is the mock turtle song first. So the first one. Will you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us, and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, won't you join the dance? You can really have no notion how delightful it will be when they take us up and throw us with the lobsters out to sea. But the snail replied, too far, too far, and gave a look askance. Said he thanked the whiting kindly, but he would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, could not join the dance. What matters how far we go, his scaly friend replied. There's another shore, you know, upon the other side. The further off from England, the nearer is to France. Then turn not pale, beloved snail, but come and join the dance. Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, won't you join the dance? And so then this is the Mock Turtle Song in Alice's Adventures Underground. Beneath the waters of the sea are lobsters thick as thick can be. They love to dance with you and me, my own gentle salmon. Chorus. Salmon come up, salmon go down. Salmon come twist your tail around. Of all the fishes in the sea, there's none so good as salmon. Okay. <laughs> This is, tis the voice of the lobster, I heard him declare. Tis the voice of the lobster, I heard him declare, you have baked me too brown, I must sugar my hair. As a duck with his eyelids, so he, with his nose, trims his belt and buttons and turns out his toes. When the sands are all dry, he is gay as a lark, and will talk in contemptuous tones of the shark. But when the tide rises and the sharks are around, his voice has a timid and tremulous sound. And then this was the finished part of the voice of the lobster. So this was done in 1886. So after that part, right? I passed by his garden and marked with one eye how the owl and the panther were sharing a pie. The panther took pie crust and gravy and meat while the owl had the dish as its share of the rare treat. When the pie was all finished, the owl as a boon was kindly permitted to pocket the spoon. While well, the panther received the knife and fork with a growl and concluded the banquet by. And it just stopped. We don't know. How did he finish the banquet? What do you think he did? <laughs> the mock turtle song second. So this is two. Beautiful soup so rich and green awaiting in a hot terrine. Who for such dainties would not stoop? Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Beautiful soup. Beautiful soup. Soup of the e e evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. Beautiful soup. Who cares for fish, game, or any other dish? Who would not have all else for two pea? Pennyworth only of beautiful soup. Pennyworth only of beautiful soup. Beautiful soup. Beautiful soup, soup of the e evening, beautiful, beautiful soup, <laughs> soup of the e e evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. <laughs> it is written with so many dashes that you have to say all of them. All right, this one is... The White Rabbit's Evidence. And this is the last one that's listed as a poem from Alice in Wonderland. So, while well, there may be more, that's all that we have in here. And so that is where I will finish this section um, and potentially record another reading for another time. But we are going to read, I'm just placing my marker so I remember, The White Rabbit's Evidence. They told me you had been to her and mentioned me to him. She gave me a good character, but said I could not swim. 
He sent them word I had not gone. We know it to be true. If she should push the matter on, what would become of you? I gave her once, they gave him two. You gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. If I or she could if I or she should chance to be involved in this affair, he trusts you to set them free exactly as we were. My notion was that you had been, before she had this fit, an obstacle that became between him and ourselves and it. Don't let him know she liked them best, for this must ever be a secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me. All right, that is it for this version, for this reading, for this session. As always, be the change you wish to see in the world, everyone. Ciao, Bella.